So last time, whoops, hang on. Oops, oh, I thought I stopped recording, but I didn't. Cool, okay. So um, last time on Drugsco, we started looking at um, counterculture just a little bit, but didn't get very far. So let's pick up where we left off, which was at the beatniks. Um, and I really hope that my recording is not going to have this huge brick of people on the side, but I guess it will. So beatniks were the group of people or a demographic basically of people, young people specifically, where after World War II, there was kind of a, a general upheaval of societal ideals and ideologies. And particularly in Greenwich Village in New York City, which is like a gay cultural hub, there started being these gatherings of youths that would talk about these subjects that had previously been declared taboo. So sex and drugs and orientation. And this started a full-blown revolution. And this was um, in response to the war having recently just ended and generally just a rejection of traditional ideals. And this involved bongos and poetry. And we looked at that a little bit last time, but then that's where we stopped. So in expanding on this a little bit, um, how many of you watched Top Cat? on uh, Boomerang. No one watched Top Cat? Are you serious? Wow, that's weird. Okay, well, here's Top Cat. This was like a cartoon from um, the like 60s, I think. And they have a beat in it. That's their beat cat representation. Playing bongos, listening to music, being far out. Now the term beatnik, which I'm sure many of you have heard at least partially in passing, actually originated from beats, but then when Sputnik, the Russian satellite went up and also happens to be my nickname, when Sputnik went into outer space, um, there was suddenly this shift in how people were viewing the beats. And beats started being known as beatniks instead of just beats because they were generally considered to be far out. And this had a really negative connotation. If you were being referred to as a beat or a beatnik, it generally was associated with you being stupid and low income and low education and low literacy and also being a drug user. And this was one of the first words that started being applied to younger white audiences in particular as being associated with being like a hedonistic drug user. And that kind of branched out, it, like the beat was the original hippie, basically. We'll see exactly where that transitioned. So this is like late 50s, mid to late 50s at this point in time. So Aldous Huxley comes out with The Doors of Perception, right? And this is the book about mescaline. He went and tried mescaline and had a crazy psychedelic experience and wrote about it. And then all these young people get their hands on this book and are like, oh yes, like psychedelics, this is interesting. So they started checking out psychedelics like mescaline and mushrooms and eventually cannabis as well. And that wasn't actually the main thing that the beatniks were known for. We'll come back to that in a second. But then there was this increased interest in Eastern spiritualities like Taoism and Buddhism, etc. So we can kind of see how in the mid late fifties, we started getting this flavoring of what would later become known as a hippie. So the, the actual two drugs that were really, really notoriously popularized among beatniks were amphetamine in the form of a benzodrine inhaler and morphine. Now, amphetamine in particular, this inhaler, this kind of inhaler was actually very popular with Hitler. Hitler loved amphetamine. In fact, Hitler was being constantly experimented on by his doctor for his gastrointestinal issues. In case you didn't know, Hitler was a gassy bitch. Oh my God, I can't believe I just said that. I'm Jewish. That's a terrible joke to make, but I just made it. So in any case, um, the original beats were known as being kind of rough and tumble, right? And they were escaping from persecution, and in the process of it, they wanted to be more creative. And amphetamine is frequently sourced as being a drug that helps them break through that layer and become creative. And ultimately, some of the leadership within Beats got really deep into morphine because World War II had just happened, so it was being used for soldiers and started getting more popularized within um, young communities. But amphetamine and morphine, and then later psychedelics and cannabis, started blossoming in these communities. And previously, before this, morphine and heroin had been really heavily used in jazz communities, kind of in an underground way, but this was one of the first times 
that we saw it becoming social and cool, in a sense. Enter hedonism. If any of you know me well, you know that I'm a big fan of hedonism, which is basically life as pursuit of pleasure. And we can really see the parallels here as we've taken this word and run with it over time. But the Beats introduced this concept. They were the ones that were like, hedonism is life in pursuit of pleasure. And because of this, they started incorporating different drugs into their lives, not only because they wanted to break traditionalism and say, fuck you to everyone that had told them not to use drugs, but also because they wanted to maximize pleasure, which makes sense, right? But interesting thing to note about the origin of the word beat is that it actually started as being a word that meant burned out. You're burned out on the system, you're no longer able to function within capitalist society. And then it became adopted as being like a freedom from the system. So this is really similar to um, tune in, turn on, drop out. Same kind of general idea, right? Is it starts out as being referential to something else and then gets co-opted by the community to mean something more pertaining to counterculture. So we'd mentioned the, the Merry Pranksters and the Further Bus and the Psychedelic Culture Spotlight. The guy that drove this bus was Neil Cassidy. And this is the guy where he would like leave the, the bus wheel, the steering wheel. He would like put a brick on the gas pedal and he would just get up and walk to the back of the bus to do something. Or just be like fully turned around and like talking to other people on the bus. And everyone was terrified of his driving because they thought they would just be thrown off of the cliff. And he was the guy that bridged this gap seamlessly between the beats and the hippies. So Neil Cassidy got into the, the further bus and the Mary, Mary Pranksters started their pilgrimage across America to deliver LSD and go party and be free with everyone. And he was the guy that was like the epicenter of these things, moving from the late 50s to the early 60s. So we start to see this trend expanding and expanding. Now let's go across the pond to London in 1958 to 1960s. Um, how many of you are already familiar with the mods and the rockers? even if just by name. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yeah, okay, okay, a couple of you. So the mods were, and I found this really interesting when I was learning about this first, the fact that this counterculture movement in the UK started with jazz, which is not really what you might expect, you know, that jazz was the origin music of hedonism in the, in the UK. But these were jazz enthusi enthusiasts that rode mopeds and they basically were just like, I don't want to call them a gang because they weren't a gang, but they acted in kind of like a gang oriented sense. And this became just this explosion of this fashion trend of being into jazz and riding a moped, which is something that all of Tumblr swoons over to this day. But this began a moral panic because they were basically going head to head like West Side Story with the rockers who were basically greasers. So you have the Vespa people and you have the greasers and they're these two youth groups that are like going out clubbing all the time and discovering different substances and they start going head to head. And these were the two major counterculture groups across the pond. So we have the Beats at the same time in New York City and moving across the country to San Francisco and kind of moving into hippie territory. And then on the other side of the world, you have the mods and the rockers. It's the same general idea. It's, it's class right now, hon. Can I come in? No, it's class. Oh, sorry. So these guys ended up just duking it out. There was a mod club that was, um, basically it was, it was catering to these youths, these jazz youths, right? But this was responsible for moving jazz into rock, jazz and blues into rock. And this is partly because of amphetamine. So amphetamine is really a 50s ass drug, like 40s and 50s amphetamine went crazy. Like actually, yeah, I see you making that facial expression. It's true. So in the 50s, as benzedrine inhalers started becoming more popular and started being used for recreational use, a lot of clubs couldn't get liquor licenses or didn't want liquor licenses because of all of the different complications that came with them. So what do people do when they can't get access to one drug that they want is they get a different one because <laughs> that's how that works. And that's why prohibition is such a big fat fucking failure. So instead of using alcohol, um, younger crowds started using amphetamines instead. And because of this, as a direct result of this, music got faster in nightlife environments. This is part of the reason that music got faster was because 
young kids would go to these jazz shows and they'd be like, go faster, go faster, go faster, to the point where there were actually musicians that would get pissed off because kids would come up to the stage and be like, can you do it faster? But this was mainly when rock started getting involved in the picture. And another popular thing was this thing called a purple heart, which was a mixture of amphetamine and a barbiturate, which is kind of like a benzo. So it was just like a, a speedball, basically, of the two of them. Now, eventually, the mods and the rockers ended up really going at each other in this absolutely hilarious thing called the Battle of Brighton Beach. This is in the 60s, right? We've fully entered hippie era across the pond. Whoops. But we have these two groups of youths. And eventually, they just broke, and they just started beating the shit out of each other on a beach in England with, like, umbrellas and fist fighting, and it was this huge thing that caused a lot of problems in terms of, like, the moral panic that I mentioned, right? It's these two youth groups that were just beating the shit out of each other on the beach in the 60s. There they go. This whole video is honestly hilarious. I wish I could find the exact part where they, like, start hitting each other with the chairs and the umbrellas and stuff. So going back across, now we're back in the United States and we have the Hells Angels. And there are four major biker gangs in the United States and the Hells Angels are one of them. Wait, so are 60s British rock bands split into mods and rockers? No, not necessarily. Um, generally speaking, the mods and the rockers were two different youth groups that had different aesthetics. And generally speaking, to my knowledge, they were mostly into similar music. Oh my God, look, I have like a mullet ducktail. I need a haircut so badly. Um, so the rock bands themselves, I don't think were often, like, I'm sure that there was some affiliation, but it wasn't like this music was for this group and this music was for this other group. It was more of a turf war kind of thing among the groups themselves. So the Hells Angels, I'm sure you're all familiar with them. They're a big ass biker gang in the United States. Um, they are extremely vehemently in denial of the fact that they make and distribute meth because they're like, we're just a bunch of guys that like bikes but you can like bikes and also make and distribute meth, which is what they do. So they've put out statements basically being like, you should criminalize the actions of the individuals. Yeah, they are legit motorcycle riders. I mean, they do that as well. But the Hells Angels as an organization are also very much known for participating in violent organized crime. It's known that Hells Angels have meth labs in Southern California. And in fact, I have it on good authority from someone who actually was friends with them in the 70s that part of the reason that meth is called crank is that Hells Angels would store it in the crank cases of their motorcycles. And the relationship between Hells Angels and truckers was actually partly related to like drugs as well. Are those the ones who show up to intimidate kids abusers? No, that's a different biker game. I don't know if Hells Angels do it too, but I know that I know the game you're talking about and those guys are cool. Um, but it's interesting because Hells Angels have like, They've said, we don't like addictive drugs, but they make meth, but they're like, we don't deal with crack, but they make meth. I don't know. Do with that information what you will. So the Hells Angels started forming, I think, in the mid-60s, approximately. Now, remember how we talked about um, the Merry Pranksters, right? The Merry Pranksters were basically like the beginning of this hippie movement. They got on their bus further and they delivered acid to the people of the world, etc. And Neil Cassidy was a beatnik guy and all those people are, are conjoined. Now, enter the Hells Angels. And you might be wondering at this point, how could you possibly mix the Hells Angels and the Merry Pranksters together? because the Merry Pranksters were like the Jesus hippies of the mid-60s, and the Hells Angels were the scary biker people of the mid-60s. Now that's exactly what makes this story so wild, is that um, the Merry Pranksters basically called up the Hells Angels and they were like, you should come to a party that we're throwing. And the Hells Angels were like, no one's ever called me before. And they showed up. And the Merry Pranksters, because everyone was afraid of the Hells Angels for the most part, they, like, people did not fuck with these guys for good reason. Um, so they showed up to the Merry Pranksters' house, and one of the guys, pictured right here at this event, um, started singing this song for them. They'd written a song about the Hells Angels, and they just like got up and started singing it at them. And the Hells Angels were so used to people being like, we don't want to fuck with you that they were just confused. And then the Merry Pranksters were like, do you guys want some acid? And they were like, I guess. And then they all did acid together. And it was complete mayhem. 
But at this point in time, acid was still legal. So this party was surrounded by police all around the perimeter because they wanted to find a reason to arrest them, but they couldn't because they weren't actually doing anything illegal. However, there was a pretty terrible um, sexual assault actually that happened at this party. And the reason that I bring this up is that it's never talked about in public documentation of this crazy acid party with the Hells Angels and the Merry Pranksters. And I want to point that out because it's a good example of how hedonism has historically been a very patriarchal activity. Like hedonism, the act of indulging in pleasure, the act of pursuit of pleasure, has been historically an extremely male-dominated thing to do. And that pursuit has often led to trampling. So I think that's a good thing to think about when you're looking at the intersectionality of, of drugs and poverty and incarceration and social justice and consent and how all these things are actually directly linked to each other. Now the rainbow gathering is something else that you guys may or may not have been aware of prior to this, but this is a completely decentralized hippie gathering that's been taking place um, in the 70s. And this is like the last remnant of true 70s hippie culture, including all of its cultural appropriation, including the problems that come with it, including the general lack of soap, and including the general excess of like love and affection and whatever else you might want to include in it. So the, the tenets of this are peace, harmony, freedom, and respect, which sounds pretty good. And hilariously, this is actually a gathering that takes place in muting you, Diego. This is actually a gathering that takes place in Rainbow Land. That's what it's called is Rainbow Land. For one to four weeks every year, there's the annual Rainbow Gathering, and it's basically just like a free-for-all. It's a hippie free-for-all. You come and you camp, and you maybe do drugs, and you play flute around a fire like this guy, and maybe hug this girl who's got sage, and she's laughing, and she has a septum ring, and that's cool. But there's no central organization to this. So the US government has had a really hard time shutting it down because when they're like, who's your leader? They're like, I don't know. And the government's like, who got your permits? And you're like, well, I mean, a couple people like just did it. <laughs> like there was no discussion about it. They were just like, I got the permit guys. And then we all just showed up here. Now, historically, as you might imagine, this is an infusion paradise. It's got psychedelics, it's got cannabis. But more recently, there have been a lot of vagrant youth that have shown up to Rainbow Gatherings just to be freeloaders, you know. Is Rainbow Land always the same place? There was a Rainbow Gathering a couple miles from my house growing up every few years. Did you grow up near Mount Shasta? Because Mount Shasta-ish area, Portland slash upstate New York, interesting. No, there's an annual Rainbow Gathering that's like a a real pilgrimage type gathering. I think that that's the one near Shasta. And then there are smaller rainbow gatherings all over the country and the world. There are rainbow gatherings everywhere. So there has been some introduction of other substances in the community recently. And some people think that it's contributing to the rise in sexual assault and violent crime that's taking place, but we're not sure. In fact, there's actually a documentary that I haven't seen that I want to called The Rainbow Murders about how a couple of years ago at this like peace, harmony, freedom gathering, I think it was two people were violently murdered on site. And there's this whole scandal about what happened. But one of the problems with this kind of thing is that since frankly, a lot of the rainbow gathering attendees freeload and uh, you know, it's not always a bad thing, but it can be a bad thing if they're passing through small towns. And sometimes people will do stuff like go to the small local hospital and skip out without leaving information and just like leave the hospitals holding the bill or overrun the trash dumpsters or I actually happen to be friends with this guy on Facebook somehow I just found this picture on the internet and realized that somehow or another I'm friends with him on Facebook I've never met him before um he's a big guy in rainbow gathering so like the rainbow gathering isn't necessarily a bad thing, you know, it's just another counterculture event that happens. But there are questions about cultural appropriation. In fact, um, I forget which tribe it was, I should remember which tribe it was, that actually issued a cease and desist to the rainbow gathering of using culturally appropriative uh, rituals and ceremonies, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, let's talk about quaaludes. So, that was mid 70s, right? Now we're moving into mid 70s party time. So the hippie movement has kind of like fizzled in terms of the more free love thing, but now we're getting into something different. Now we're getting back into clubbing. So the timeline is, we have World War II, 
people start engaging in hedonism in the form of beats, and then on the other side of the world, mobs and rockers, and amphetamine hits the scene, and alcohol stops being as available in clubs, so people use other drugs instead, barbiturates become more popular, then the 60s roll around, and of course that's like the counterculture hub of eternity. We see a spike in the use of cannabis and psychedelics and all kinds of other stuff like that, and now we're moving into the 70s, where the rainbow gathering is like the last remnant of like really strong hippie culture that is more surface level and accessible and hit mid 70s and all of a sudden discotheques which we're going to come to in a second but this is a new kind of club nightlife is moving indoors again whereas for a while it had been very nature oriented and outdoor oriented and it, it still is to an extent but now we're starting to see more technology involved in this Technology was a huge indicator of how partying changed. So um, how many of you are already acquainted with Quaaludes, at least by name? Okay, a couple people, but not many. Okay, so a Quaalude, um, if you ask your parents, probably for those of you that are in your 20s or 30s, if you ask your parents about Quaaludes, a lot of them will probably be like, oh yeah, I loved Quaaludes because they were a very lightly used recreational substance in the 70s. Think benzo, but hornier, much hornier. I have a story to tell you guys about quaaludes. So they do have the sim a similar addiction profile as benzos. They're similar substances in a lot of ways, but they were basically known as, be they were known as disco biscuits because you would take them and go to discotheques. That was the thing. And they were super easy to get without a prescription. At this point in time, quaaludes are almost impossible to find. They got really phased out because people were like, oh, actually you can get really dependent on these things. We didn't realize that. And, you know, now benzos are here and people are having the same realization, but sometimes a little bit too late. How would you dance being so tired? I mean, how do you dance drunk? Same idea, right? So here's my story about quaalude, Methoquilone. So I read this story a couple of years ago an, a first-hand account from a guy, I think in the 70s or 80s, um, who was invited with his wife to go to a wedding. And before they go to the wedding, they don't drive high, kids, but they both took some quaaludes and they were like, okay, great, we're going to have like a nice, relaxed, like non-anxious, chilled out car ride. It was only like a 45-minute car ride to this wedding. And it took them four hours to get there because they stopped at every exit to fuck. Because quaaludes were known as being, like, orgy-friendly, extremely arousing substances. So that's my story about quaaludes. Okay, now we're in discotheque land. And discotheques were the start of raving. How many of you are really, really interested in raving as a concept? Okay. All right, a couple of you. Fewer than I was expecting. Well, dot, 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 yeah. <laughs> hey, it's not all ground control in here, man. A little interested, but maybe not really, really. Rave life for life. Okay, we got a whole variety of responses to that one. So this right here, discotheques, were the start of everything that we know as raving today in terms of a nightclub experience. But what many of you might not realize is that raving as we know it began as basically an escape from marginalized communities. Discotheques were a safe haven for gay men in particular, for Hispanic Latinx folks, for black folks, like all kinds of uh, people of color would find sanctuary in discotheques and trans folks and like all over the spectrum. Now that's part of the reason that it's so problematic that right now today the vast majority of mainstream artists in electronic music are white men because these spaces began specifically explicitly as safe havens for minority demographics so disco took the fuck off right we have jazz that goes into rock that goes into um disco basically i mean there's also acid house and house music and all kinds of genres in there um, that started in the late 70s, early 80s when synthesizers were starting to get created, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So this was where hedonism started taking place in 
public. This was where it became like you went to a club and you lost yourself for the night, right? And one of the main examples of this was Studio 54. Are any of you guys familiar with Studio 54? Whoops. Laurie, you are familiar with Studio 54? Huh, funny. So for those of you that are not, it's New York, right? Well, New York. Locked outdoors, you were in another world. Andy Warhol, Calvin Klein, Elizabeth Taylor, Mick Jagger. It was hot, sexy. It's like an adult amusement park. It is so preposterous. We both came from Brooklyn. They had this understanding that they were getting out and they were going to do something big together. We want to be the ultimate nightclub. Beautiful models, celebrities with gay men, transgenders, and it all started blending. A world of fantasy that absolutely exploded. Sex was in the air. There were mattresses in the basement. The amount of drugs was profound. Everyone felt like they had to be there. The people started to get angry because they couldn't get in. You can't have this much popularity without somebody wanting to take it down. All of a sudden, the lights were on the police and it was like the reality was in your face. The basement had bags of cash and drugs. The feds, mafia, the White House, they definitely messed with the wrong people. Controversy was like a moth to a flame and it got even bigger. A haven for inclusion and acceptance. I don't think they had any idea that it would be important in our culture and the history of what was going on all around the world. This was revolutionary. I have yet to watch the whole documentary. It's been on my list for years. Good joke, Jay. I like it. Um, Don't forget I was born in 68, so I mean, like, Studio 54 was the cool place where everybody wanted to go. Yeah, man, yeah. So, Studio 54 got shut down for tax evasion for $2.5 million, and you have to remember that during this time period, $2.5 million is a lot of fucking money, but more so than that, actually the mom of one of the guys that owned this place was, unbeknownst to her, I believe, keeping a log of who had what drug purchases in bulk. So they had this massive incriminating basement full of drugs and cash and a literal log of who sold what to who and who owed who for this money. But Studio 54, like I'm sure that those of you that are familiar with Burning Man, with like raving, with any kind of hedonistic counterculture environment can see just from these photos, this was the club as well as the limelight that really set things off. This was the Tinder. Now, meanwhile, in the late 70s, or the early 70s to the late 80s, this was like a 15 year time period, cocaine came back. So again, we're seeing this transition from amphetamine to cocaine. But there's a reason that coke came back during this time. In the early 1900s, there was a newspaper article that was released. I think that I've mentioned this before. In response to black laborers, that were being given cocaine by white merchants and business owners to speed up productivity. And then they became too productive and the white merchants and business owners were like, uh-oh. And they started doing that thing where they were like, cocaine makes black people rape your wives. Because that's always the thing. That's always the thing. And Basically, they just like completely snatched it back and they were like, nope, we actually don't want this after all. So we're going to use you being violent and criminal and assaulting people as a scapegoat. Um, $12 million today was $2.5 million in 1975. Thanks, Mark. That's really interesting. That's a lot of money. <laughs> That's almost as much as my net worth, but not quite. So it is important to note this fact that Coke vanished, basically, in the United States for a long time. It just wasn't very popular between the, like, early 1900s all the way up through the, the like, late 60s, early 70s. And the reason it came back was that in the early 70s in Bolivia, there was a huge economic crash. And so farmers started farming coca again because it was one of the only things that was sustainable and economic to grow. Now, Cuban cartels snatched this opportunity. They were like, oh, interesting. I think we could make more money off of this than we could off of cannabis right now. So 
they started importing cocaine to the United States. And there's this really interesting way that this happened that we'll go into in a later lecture. It involved a CIA operant, actually. As most import stories do, the CIA was involved in getting coke into the United States. That's happened on many occasions. We'll look at it, I think, next week. Um, so all of a sudden, there was coke in the United States again. And people were like, oh, wow, this is like really glamorous because it's short acting and it's really powerful and it looks cool when you snort it. So lo and behold, white people got their hands on cocaine and led to things like this from Boogie Nights, this one scene. We'll go to the gym, we'll get punk, we'll down and we'll fucking deal with that guy, right? We'll get the fucking tapes and we'll fucking, you know, we don't even have to pay him once we get him. Whoa, 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 I will do it. I will do it. I will do it. You don't to fucking control everything, man. You don't realize you don't get the fucking shit. There's a chick at the front desk. Walk right past her. Right. So this movie tries to kind of capture the irritation that comes with frequent chronic cocaine use. If any of you guys have ever been at an event where people were doing like a lot of coke for the entire night, people tend to get pretty testy by the end. They tend to get a little bit irritable, if not very irritable. And then there's of course this famous scene from Pulp Fiction where she thinks that she's doing a line of coke, but she's actually doing a line of heroin and she overdoses on it. Let's see. And she's out. Now these were all kind of representative of the times, right? Like this was a glamorous thing. And also, I just want to show you guys this photo of the basement of Studio 54, where there's mattresses and a kiddie pool with a Barbie doll and a fish in it. Um, so, yeah, this was a drug that was declared to be not dangerous because so many high-profile people were using it. Like, Coke was everywhere. Wolf of Wall Street, I'm sure all of you guys are familiar with that one, at least to an extent. Like, Leonardo DiCaprio doing lines of that I haven't seen it, that's just what I've heard. So it was declared to be non-dangerous until all of a sudden in the late 80s, people started dying. And then everyone was like, what? Wait, cocaine could be dangerous? Because everyone was operating under the, under the assumption that it was just like safe, you could do as much as you wanted, it was not a big deal. And then eventually people started realizing, oh wow, actually wait, this, this drug can be actually pretty addictive. In fact, one of Sigmund Freud's best friends died I think either from a cocaine overdose or from complications. And a coke overdose, right, is excessive stimulation, which can lead to cardiac arrest. You have heart palpitations and an arrhythmia, and your heart stops. That can happen from cocaine overdose. And other stimulant overdoses as well, that's often what happens, and sometimes can be seizures. So just to kind of recap, we've looked at a lot of what are called, or what are sometimes known as designer drugs or club drugs. And these are drugs that are generally used in a partying recreational setting. Now, I'm sorry that we don't go over poppers in this course. I know I've mentioned this. I wish I had time to add in something about it, but we're already behind schedule. So we have nitrous, amphetamines, cocaine, poppers, ketamine, quaaludes, and MDMA are the major club drugs, the major ones. Now we're at raves, right? So little known fact is that rave actually stands for radical audio visual experience, <laughs> which Technically means that like a lot of things could be considered raves if you really want to stretch the definition, but generally speaking, a rave is a gathering of people to dance to often electronic music or faster paced music. Now, part of the reason that drugs became so popularized in raving is because venues stopped serving alcohol. And I know I mentioned this before, but this is really a major determining factor of why other drugs became incorporated into these things. But raves are held everywhere. And an underground rave, as some of you may or may not know, is one that's held illegally. It's held in an illicit location without permitting for that location in particular. Now, they can be in the form of inside of a club, or it can be what's called a renegade, which is in a non-building location, such as um, this looks like probably some kind of storm drain or sewage tunnel, and this is a cave. And um, there are plenty of raves in a cave nowadays still. So. In the um, late 90s, Frankie Bones, or it was actually late 80s, I think, Frankie Bones, who was a UK DJ, introduced raving to the United States. So 
on the West Coast in the 90s, raves just started popping up everywhere, and they were huge. They were like 2,000 people at these underground parties, or actually a lot of them weren't even underground. They were just huge raves that were spurned by Frankie Bones, this DJ that was like, hey, check out this music that's crazy that you haven't heard, and the United States was like, whoa, that's insane. Let's listen to it all the time and do a lot of drugs when we do it. So eventually, in the early 2000s, curfews started getting instated which is why raves went underground again. For a while, there were just huge raves happening everywhere all the time in sports stadiums and people's backyards even, but that was less common. Like all over the place, you could just get a permit and throw a rave a lot more easily. But the curfew was what made undergrounds a thing because initially it was that you could just go in one location and go all night. But then when the curfew was instated at like 2 a.m., you had to find a place to go after that. So people started getting creative and that's how undergrounds became a thing. I feel like I'm telling the story of Christmas right now. So here's an example of a flyer that you might've seen. This is um, New Year's Eve of 1992. And here's Frankie Bones on the flyer and a couple of other um, less major names, or maybe they are and I just don't recognize them. But peace and love and unity and respect. That's like a, a, an acronym that's known as PLUR and Actually, the origin story of PLUR, which is something that a lot of raver babies um, currently present day say to each other, um, they'll be like, peace, love, unity, respect, that's our mantra. The origin of it was actually at a party in, or at a rave in, in New York City in the 90s. Frankie Bones was DJing and there was a fight on the dance floor and he actually got up on the mic and shut off the music and was like, can we get some fucking peace, love, unity, and respect in this joint? So initially it was a call to action to stop fist fighting on the dance floor, but the high people were like, oh nice, and then started using it for other purposes. Hashtag plur. So um, underground techniques used a couple of, they still do to this day actually, use a couple of of tactics. So initially, you get a flyer like this delivered to your mailbox on the day of, and it would have a phone number at the bottom, which is called an info line. So for instance, this is 1-800-4-RAVE-LINE, and you see it says right there, map point after 8 p.m., and it gives you an address. So the whole idea here is that you call a phone number. It can be a little bit different configuration depending on the event. You call this phone number called the map point, or it's called the info line, gives you information about where to go next and what to do at that location. And then when you get there, you do that thing and then you get an actual physical map that's like X marks the spot to tell you where to go. So it could be like, go to the Dunkin' Donuts on First and E or whatever, E Street, and look for the guy wearing khaki shorts, reading a newspaper, and tell him you're looking for the purple triangle and he'll like give you a map that tells you where to go. So that's an info line and a map point. Frankie supposedly didn't mention respect. It was just peace, love, unity. Really? Huh. I've heard that story told differently. I'll have to check that. Um, so those were the two main things. And that still happens to this day. You know, there are still, um, there are still map points. There are still info lines. Sometimes you get an info line that's like, go to this corner and look for the white shuttle van. And then you get inside of it and there's a guy on the intercom and you drive up to this mansion and it's got these gates that swing open. He says, welcome to the underground. And that's like a real thing that still happens. It's become less, less and less uh, feasible to do map points to this day, which is sad. But. So let's look at some different rave tunes. So this is music. <laughs> what I meant to say is this is Gabber. <laughs> So Gabber is a genre that like started getting popularized in the mid 90s in the UK. And it, it was kind of satirical actually, like a lot of the faster rave genres started out being a little bit satirical, only in the sense that they were just like, be stupid, let your limbs fly, do whatever the fuck it is that you wanna do, like go dance, be silly, don't take yourself too seriously. So this genre, Gabber, started this fashion trend of Think fuck Jerry aesthetics, but windbreakers and like this particular kind of dance. <laughs> so there's Gabber. Popularized in the Netherlands, as are many things. And now here's Thunderdome, an example of like gabber gatherings and like larger scale. I think Thunderdome just celebrated its 26th anniversary or something like that. And it's just like all fast paced music, 
like this. Check out those pupils, huh? Everybody rolling. Everybody rolling. Look at those pupils. You can always tell. Yeah, I know. I miss it too. Now there's how. Oh no, both of these? All right, so here's a classic happy hardcore anthem. So from Gabber, there came other offshoots of different fast paced electronic music genres. And I love to share happy hardcore because it is one of the loves of my life and very few people know about it. My jaw hurt watching that. <laughs> okay, so here's a classic example of happy hardcore. That's like classic happy hardcore, okay? So happy hardcore was a genre that moved electronic music into this very fluffy, cheesy thing. And then we have candy, and you can see candy on this person's arms. Um, these are known as cuffs, 3D cuffs. And oftentimes, it, these are called chunkies with like baby toys and shit on them. This is called a side chain, and these are fat pants. It's a lot of terminology. It's a visor. This is like a classic, like 90s rave look that is very American. Um, UK ravers or European ravers don't really do this. In fact, a lot of bros listen to happy hardcore, like this stuff is like bro tunes. This is like fratty tunes in some regions of the UK. Whereas the United States, you have to really go out of your way. Yes, so, and yes, DDR music. So candy kids are um, often very colorful, brightly colored rave kids that have candy, K-A-N-D-I. And initially, candy was actually made as different colored bracelets indicating that you were a dealer at a party. Um, but then some wires got crossed and people started making their bracelets for fun and people would go up to them being like, are you on deck? And they would get really confused and that mode of signaling ended. <laughs> so now it's just something that you do as a trade. So if you make a bunch of what are called candy singles, you have these bracelets and if you meet someone that you like or you just want to give them something, you go up to them. And depending on what kind of rave you're at, because not every rave is candy friendly, let me tell you that. There are a lot of parties that are not like this. Um, you would hold up your peace sign and they would return it, and then you would give them a heart, the unity, and then you drag the candy over onto their arm. It's like a little ritual. And then there's other different genres of music that were popularized in rave. So things got faster through time. It started out with techno and house, and then moved into breakbeats and jungle and drum and bass and gabber and hardcore, UK hardcore, happy hardcore, um, neurofunk, acid breaks, acid house, like all kinds of stuff. So this is an example of what would be known as breakbeats. Oh no, this is jungle. Lots of high-pitched voices, and this was sample-based music. So you took a sample and you did stuff with it. Actually, that was breaks. Then there's jungle. This is more modern-day jungle. It's like kind of a, a subset of a genre called drum and bass. And then there's more modern-day. This is kind of like UK hardcore-ish. I know this is more like break drum and bass ish. Yes, candy culture is a very US specific thing. That was older gamer, also. That was like gamer, I think pre 2005. I'm not positive. Um, but yes, if you go to the Netherlands, you do not see this kind of shit. Like the US took happy hardcore and made it very fluffy and frothy. Um, so some of you might have had parents that were like, don't go to raves, everyone's on drugs. And that's true. I'm not going to lie to you guys. Like, pretty much, like, not every single person at a rave is going to be high, but the concentration per capita of people on drugs versus not on drugs is quite a lot higher than you find in most other environments. I'll be completely transparent about it. Um, there isn't typically the kind of peer pressure that a lot of people are warned about in raving. A lot of the time, it's just like a very different kind of story. Um, people just happen to be really high. You can tell that these guys are rolling immediately just from looking at their faces. This guy, too. You can see, actually, 
in photos like this, you can kind of see people's pupils, even in this small of a size at this great of a distance, there's a particular quality that their eyes take on when they're rolling, where you can tell that it's just a little too big for how it would be otherwise. Also, the red eye is legendary. But a lot of the time, MDMA is like the drug of choice at certain kinds of raves that have more like feely, feely music. Um, at other parties, like techno parties and house parties, you might found, find some other different substances of, of choice there. Um, then psytrance parties are like ketamine and nitrous haven centers. Um, so yeah, it, it really does depend on the kind of rave that you're going to. You're not always going to find Kenny. Now, in the meantime, in the late 80s, we have this other thing that's happening called Club Kids, which some of you might be familiar with already. And here's Michael Alec, who is like the leader of the Club Kids. And this was what basically started revolutionizing gender bending in club settings and like theatrical costuming. And it was inspired by Andy Warhol and very sexualized. Now, um, this guy, Michael Alec, was the, the ringleader of this group of, of clubbers that became known as the Club Kids. And they were just all out, all over the top, like heavy costume, heavy makeup, think voguing, honestly. Um, so here's an example of what they would throw as like an outlaw party, which is basically they would just take over a public space, like in this case, a McDonald's. And they would just throw these very like sexualized, cartoony outlaw parties. And sometimes they would end up like moving the party to the back of a truck or something like that. Um, and the limelight was the club that was big on this one. So in the 70s, we had Studio 54 that got shut down for tax evasion. In the 80s, we have the limelight establishment, which I think got shut down because of this, which was murder. So in the late 80s, we have this club, the limelight. It is the club kids central. It is the place where it becomes popularized to show up and be completely wild, wild. We're talking like one time Michael Alec, this guy right here, um, was locked in a cage on the bottom floor of this venue. And um, there was a sign on it that said, don't feed the drug child or something. And people would just feed him various substances through the cage walls. And in some other settings, um, or at least in another point, he would stand on the terrace in this venue and just pee all over everyone on the dance floor below. Things got really crazy with Michael Alec. Um, he was a very wild character. Was there a lot of intersection with ballroom culture? You mentioned voguing. I can't say with certainty, but I would imagine there would be. Um, this was a very trans-friendly, very minority community-friendly, very sexual orientation, fluidity, gender identity, fluidity, friendly environment. This was like where all of it intersected. So I would be shocked if there wasn't some kind of intersection with ballroom, but I'm not sure. So this guy, Michael Alec, um, and this guy, Angel, were very good friends, but Michael Alec got really deep into a whole variety of substances, I think most notably heroin, and but like a whole variety. He was in so, so deep. And at one point, he got into an argument with Angel about who owed who what money for what drug. I can't remember which one exactly. And he ended up smothering Angel with a pillow until he passed out, um, pouring bleach into his mouth and duct taping it shut and then dismembering him and putting him in a bathtub and freezing him in a bathtub and then putting him in a box and throwing him in a river where he washed up on shore a few days later to be discovered by a child and which must have been unreal. And then after a while, Michael Alec was traced down and then after he was in imprisoned, he like made this documentary and has been the subject of a lot of interviews and just is like so flashy even still about it to this day and unfortunately that doesn't work um there's a pretty good movie about the starring macaulay culkin as alec yes i think i've seen that one actually now burning man so this is moving into more modern day raving hedonism counterculture right this is the last thing we're going to look at today um, miraculously for a full lecture in one class, which is what's going to be the norm from now on. So in the, I think, uh, was it? Yeah, 1986, it says it right there. 1986 on Baker Beach in San Francisco, a group of friends built a wooden effigy and burned it and just like 
hung out and made stuff together and partied and went wild. Then this became just an expansive event. It kept happening in different ways and different forms until eventually they were like, this is too big. We have to find a place to go do this. We just like gather people and it's a lawless thing and whatever happens, happens. So eventually they landed on Black Rock Desert, Nevada. And this became the place where every year since then, for the first time in the entire history of the event, it is not happening there this year. Um, but this became the place where every year people would make a pilgrimage out to Black Rock Desert, Nevada, and they would burn a wooden effigy. And during the week around it, it started out as the only rule was um, no guns in center camp and don't ruin anyone else's immediacy. Those were the rules and everything else was just like set up your shit wherever you want, bring whatever you want, if anything. And it just expanded and expanded and expanded. And in 1991, they lit up the man for the first time. That's why it's called Burning Man. Um, so this was built as a place to basically become more connected with other people. That was the idea behind it was just like an, a tabula rasa experimental environment where you can do your thing and try and understand the people around you and not be as constrained by the default world, which is the world that we live in on a daily basis. It's an escapism paradise. And you might find shit like this, this thing that was actually roped off because someone got impaled on its tusk because this is like a flaming hog that spun in circles. Um, Burning Man is extremely controversial for many reasons. And some of them are valid and some of them are honestly just the product of misunderstanding the community. There are a lot of very real problems with Burning Man, but it also is truly and sincerely one of the most remarkable feats of human ingenuity ever. Um, it is a flat desert expanse where 80,000 people go every year. Getting a ticket is almost impossible. And nothing is provided for you except for porta potties and a center camp where you can buy ice and coffee. Other than that, nothing is bought or sold on the premises, not a single thing. And every single piece of art that is there is both built and brought by the same people that pay to go. All of this art that you see right now was built and brought by just like people that felt like it. It's all a gift. It's all a gifting economy. It's making me really sad. Um, and there's all kinds of crazy shit here. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like it. Here's another thing where uh, the doors would like swing open and someone fell off of that thing. Now, currently, there are 10 principles of Burning Man, and they include things like radical self reliance, um, civic responsibility, gifting, radical self expression, and they each mean something different. Also, leave no trace is a huge thing, and the 11th principle, consent, is being integrated into it right now. Um, this environment is multiple miles wide in this crescent shape that is alkaline dust. It's a very fine white dust that you can't get out of anything unless you have white vinegar to scrub it out. And sometimes there are just 60 mile an hour dust storms and you could have respiratory failure and die if you don't have a dust mask on that can effectively filter these particles. Sometimes these dust storms last for six or seven hours. And if you're away from camp without your dust mask, you can't see anything in front of your face and you can't really breathe, it can be quite dangerous. So this is a really hostile desert environment on the windier, dustier years, sometimes like a third of the people that didn't come prepared will just like leave after a few days because they can't handle it. They're like, oh, this is actually like survival mode. You are surviving in a hostile environment for a week. Um, the other thing they take really seriously is moop, matter out of place. And this is a map that shows you exactly how much trash there is when they're done. If there is a cubic foot or more. We're talking literally like this much trash in the entirety of Burning Man by the time this 80,000 person event is over. It doesn't get re-permitted for the next year. A cubic foot. So there's two months of people scraping every square inch of this territory to make sure that not a shred of trash remains behind. Then at the end of the week, everyone gathers in this huge circle and people spin fire and they blow up the man in a mushroom cloud. And um, the idea is a matter out of place and the idea of gift giving were inspired by anthropologists Mary Douglas and Marcel Mouse, respectively. Mouse. That's really interesting. That's lovely. Hmm, nice Jay. So really anything can happen at Burning Man and I, I truly do mean anything. 
anything, anything. You might be in the middle of the desert with nothing around you for hundreds of feet, and then you're biking up on something and it's a bounce house, just like in the desert. Someone just like hauled a bounce house and a generator out there and just left it up in case anyone wanted to go bouncing. Um, when I say blow it up in a mushroom cloud, I mean a mushroom cloud. In fact, 2008, 2009, um, the theme of the man was Green Man, which was supposed to be about climate change. But one of the statues that someone made was called Crude Awakening, and it was a bunch of crude oil barrels. And they blew it up in the largest non-military explosion in history. <laughs> it was a mushroom cloud so big that if you were like half a mile away from the blast radius, your eyebrows could get singed off. Um, there are, as you might imagine, quite a few drugs at Burning Man, possibly not to anybody's surprise. This is a really famous photo that really circulated the internet, um, predominantly psychedelics, but you can find most club drugs at Burning Man. Ketamine is very popular. Nitrous is known as hippie crack or robot poop. Um, and here's the crude awakening explosion. Yeah, oh, sorry, my Discord is making noise in the background. Ready? Holy crap! What? <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> and then there's the temple. Last thing we'll go over. The temple is um, a place for grief and for mourning and for re introspection um and for recovery and oh my god shut the fuck up discord um no i am not even gonna do that right now oh god no i can't even get back in ah okay maybe that should be it oh this is the last slide okay cool well um yeah so the temple is jesus i'm gonna go crazy that sound is driving me nuts shut up so the temple is a place, um, like I said, for mourning and for loss and for grief, but also for joy and for grat gratefulness. And sometimes an orchestra shows up and plays there because they can. And it too is burned at the end of every week as a symbolic recognition of the transience of what we have and what we love. That's all for today. Um, I will see you guys on Thursday night, and we'll be looking into dealing and the drug war. Have a great night, you guys. Thank you all.